So I think we will um, start off with questions for um, Dr. Park and Dr. Kovitz. And I will let you guys decide uh, between the two of you which one you would like to answer. So, um, uh, are you guys? Yeah. All right, so the question is in FDA trials for epidiolex, was executive function um, impairment, particularly in regard to attention, a side effect? Um, well, I think I briefly touched upon this with somebody else uh, who had asked. I think it was quite difficult in the trials to assess for, for children to assess those measures because um, of the population that was chosen. So these were uh, young children with very severe um, epilepsies, especially for the Lens Gasto trial. And so it was quite difficult to find a measure that was going to be appropriate to, to test those children. Um, I think when they did the, um, the animal studies um, in, in pre um, preclinical trials, they did do some uh, measurements of, um, of function, both uh, motor function as well as, um, you know, kind of executive function and memory with, uh, with mazes and um, with other tasks that they asked the mice to do. Uh, and, well, I mean, I guess I don't ask them. But, <laughs> in there. but at any rate, um, and I, I don't think that there was evidence of impairment, which is part of the evidence that was used to say that this was a safe compound. Um, I will add that uh, the upward sleepiness scale, so not testing executive function, but they did look at the sleepiness aspect of it, and that did not change for those on placebo versus the actual medication. Um, so, uh, I think this is for Ryan. Uh, could you talk about travel to other states, uh, countries, maybe cruise ships with a medical card? A lot of different places. Sounds like a good year. Um, so I think you know, travel is difficult um, to do with marijuana just because you're crossing state lines at that point. And so that brings a number of concerns. One, you know, you're going to a different state and you're dealing with different states' laws that are going to govern at that point. Uh, and so you may go into a state that has less permissive marijuana laws. Uh, in addition, kind of at the federal level, then you know, you're kind of doing. Um, interstate trafficking, um, and that in and of itself is, is kind of a problem and a risk. So I would not recommend traveling um, from state to state. If you're traveling from a state that allows it into a state that allows it, um, and you're very positive of that, maybe the risk is pretty low, but it's you're adding complications and risk whenever you cross state lines. Um, traffic, over, in, whenever you get on a plane, I think that's when you add even another level of risk, and then of course you're, you're subject to federal agencies at that point um, who regulate air travel and, and they don't want you to, um, it's not allowed to, to carry marijuana onto the plane even if you're going from Denver to Seattle. Uh, and then of course when you're going from the U.S. to a different country, uh, then even more so another level of risk um, at that point you're kind of into treaties and international law and, and, and then, you know, I don't think you want to go into customs of another country with, with marijuana at this point. Um, and cruise ships, I think, is, is, is much the same at this point. Um, maybe not as much risk of enforcement, but the same legal, legal risk there. Uh, Dr. Schultz, this is one of three, it's long. <laughs> so, uh, what is the known about the effects of CBD on non normal cells in the brain, especially in microglia, astrocytes, and infiltrating immune cells, some of which constantly cycle through parts of the brain? Could these effects be relevant to epileptogenesis, especially post-traumatic or other epilepsy symptoms? Um, no, it's, uh, of course, it's an excellent question. Uh, so, um, so uh, as we discussed, uh, those of you who heard my talk, uh, CBD um, has many, many effects, right? Many molecular targets. And uh, therefore, it's not very surprising that CBD will have effect on not just on neurons, but also on other cells in the brain. And the main, there's a whole class of cells that we refer to as glial cells in the brain. And there are many types of glial cells. These, in the past, we used to say that they just they're just there to feed the neurons and support them. They're kind of the caretakers. But actually, now we know that they do much more than that. 
and the and the sort of uh, glial cells, some of which are called microglial or astrocytes, or some that wrap around the long processes of neurons to make the signals go faster. So the bottom line is that there are all these cells, and and yes, there are there is evidence that that cannabinoids in general uh, can affect and do affect signaling in these um, cells. And also immune cells that can uh, influence brain inflammation. So we know it's very clear that epilepsy is associated with, um, or modulated by, um, in what we call a, a neuroinflammation in the brain. So this means that there are um, cells that play a role in, um, in the inflammation in the body, they can infiltrate the brain and they uh, contribute uh, to uh, epilepsy. So that's, uh, there's a whole part of science, of neuroscience, that deals with this, um, the effect of neuroinflammation in neurological and psychiatric disorders, specifically in epilepsy. So yes, the short answer is that Cannabinoids definitely also affect uh, these cells, uh, and uh, precisely dissecting which effects are important, uh, we are not there yet. More research is needed. Fully understand. And so this is for Dr. Hoffman. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious. Um, you mentioned that there are That's a great question, and I say absolutely, I hope so. So it's currently FDA approved, not just based, it's not based on age, or also, no, it's not based on age, it's based on the conditions that it got FDA approved for. Um, so adults I've prescribed for with Lennox Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome, and I've actually tried a couple of times to prescribe for patients who just have intractable epilepsy. So there's a currently a study being done, it's called the Open Label Extension Trial. So we've got the usual trials, and then if we're seeing a good response, they open it up and they allow people to continue, and then other people to be recruited to the trial. And that's 1,200 people right now, uh, some of whom I sincerely hope are my uh, adults with temporal lobe epilepsy or frontal lobe epilepsy or generalized epilepsies that don't have Dravet syndrome or Lennox Gastaut because I do believe there's going to be benefit in those individuals as well. So I would also add that, um, that the environmental landscape for medication prescription is such that oftentimes the FDA indication is not what always drives the medication prescription. So if you think about Onfi, which is a which is clobazam, it was initially studied and marketed and, and um, approved for the treatment of drop seizures in Lennox Gastaut syndrome. And initially, most insurances would say you had to have a diagnosis of Lennox Gastaut syndrome in order to take that medication. And now that it's been out of the market for quite some time, the indications have expanded. So people are now prescribing it for refractory axon seizures or refractory convulsions in J JME or other types of epilepsy. The question is whether the insurance company will pay for that treatment. And usually Usually what happens is it kind of trickles down and so once you say to the insurance company this is a patient who's failed you know five other medications I'd like to put them on on or I'd like to put them on a dialect they will say okay we well, you don't have a lot of options we will go ahead and authorize that and that is kind of a, a typical pattern for many anticonvulsant medications and so I think what will hopefully happen is that people will begin to be able to prescribe it and insurance companies will begin to be able to pay for it for other types of epilepsy the question is whether or not the insurance company or the, the pharmaceutical company itself will go back and do additional trials to get FDA approval for additional indications. And that's not necessarily our call. Um, many companies do that because they feel as though that's, that's helpful for them, but it, it's not really mandatory and it kind of controls how fast that process goes. Um, and so I think it's, it's kind of a, a wait and see approach as to whether or not it's going to be an FDA indication or whether it's just going to be available for people and, and you have to go on an individual basis. This next set of questions um, is uh, sort of two related questions, and uh, friends, for you, uh, I don't know if you want to have somebody else from the legal field come up and help or not, but uh, uh, let us know. We can walk around with the microphone. Um, can an employer ask if you're on medical cannabis? And then, related to that, prior to an offer of an 
point of employment, can or should you ask to see the company's drug use policy? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, it, it, since you're in the front row, do you, do you want to take it? Or? Well, um, let's see what I understand. Can I ask, first of all? Yeah. Yeah. but that CBD anti-seizure effects are thought to be CB1 receptor independent. Do you think that, do you think the protective effects of CBD would outweigh the potential risks of THC depending on the THC to CBD ratio? Um, again, a great question. So, so, you know, if you guys want to join my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a great question. So, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so THC, at concentrations, uh, you know, the higher concentration, the more likely the THC is going to be uh, to downregulate or decrease the number of CB1 receptors on, um, on neuronal processes. Um, and yes, CBD's actions, as far as we know, by and large, um, anti epileptic actions are CBD are CB1 receptor independent. Right. Um, now, so you know, if you have a CB1, high CB1, low THC uh, ratio, um, then the likelihood is that you will preserve the beneficial effects of CBD as well as THC uh, without the down regulation of the receptors. Does that answer the question? Uh, so, for Dr. Parkin, Dr. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around CBD uh, focusing on convulsive seizures. Is there any research on CBD and temporal lobe epilepsy, um, specifically related to deja vu or hallucination seizures? So I think non-convulsive seizures. Well, I, I, I don't think um, clearly for um, for the studies that have been done. Most, uh, although children with lax gusto and and dry syndrome have other types of seizures. <laughs> Um, I don't know that there, there have been isolated partial seizure research. Um, most of the research that we have has been from the um, retrospective data that we talked about for the children and for other people who have been reported to use it. And I think it still does have a similar effect on other seizure types besides those um, it, within those two syndromes. But I don't know that we have um, specific data about how effective it is for temporal lobe epilepsy versus, um, versus Another legal question. Now that school nurses are approved to administer CBD at schools, would the foundation be able to administer medication at camp if it's done by a school nurse? Or possibly done by a school nurse? 
because the question of foundation. So the epilepsy foundation coordinates that epilepsy can't look at a stop and for children. Yeah, so uh, the question being, can a school nurse a foundation minister with the new school nurse law? Um, yeah, I think you know, this is the thing that's probably the newest change to the medical marijuana law that, that I see on a frequent basis. And so the I would say that the answer I don't think is, is clear at this point. I think if the school um, had a policy that they wanted to allow nurses to administer, I think that would encompass the situation. Um, but I would caution that what's I think about to happen is uh, the State Department of Education is about to do some rulemaking about you know, what it is on a particular level that's going to be required for a school who wants to put that nurse administration uh, practice into effect. So I think we, we may know more of the answer to that um, in the fairly near future. I would also add to that that I think it depends upon not only the school nurse being covered under state regulations, but also that the camp is going to be held at, um, at a facility run by another organization and that their um, you know, regulations and policies may need to be considered as well. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm just saying. Law school, Dr. Park. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's a lawyer. So. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Schultz, can you talk more about head injuries and CBD? Um, what does it mean for the epilepsy population who may have had injuries from, uh, from falls or head injury while skiing? Um, and is there some role for CBD? Um, well, so as I, I, I mentioned this a uh, little bit, that, that in general, uh, we don't know enough about what we call epileptogenesis. That is when you have, for example, some injury, like a head injury, severe head injury. We know that if you have a head injury, severe head injury, your chances of developing epilepsy over the years is going to be increased, right? This process by which a brain has let's say, been shaken up or it's injured, that it then undergoes some uh, changes, neuronal and other changes, that then end up, uh, ends up um, develop, you know, resulting in seizures. That process is called epileptogenesis. And in general, we have no drugs, zero, that actually effectively uh, control this process, right? So we don't have what we call anti-epileptogenic drugs, right? So uh, that's fundamental the issue. Um, so, you know, it's a very difficult thing to study in, in uh, animal models, by the way, uh, because, uh, you know, if you do give an injury to, let's say, a mouse, um, if it's a good model of post-traumatic epilepsy, for example, the epilepsy will develop the mouse over many months, right? So it's a very slow process. And then you are trying to give drugs to that animal. So you have there are many animals to have a you know, statistical significance. So one of the reasons is really this, that the process of epileptogenesis is long and it be, it's hard to study. And as far as I know, there is no actual evidence that CBD uh, specifically CBD would alter this, right? So let me just say finally, just in uh, 30 seconds, that uh, I think somebody mentioned it, that when people have an injury, like head injury, uh, the natural cannabinoid compounds in the brain, what they call the endocannabinoids, surge in, in, uh, in, the, in their concentration, right? And that's because neurons are very active when you have a head injury, and a they will release these compounds on mass. And so you have these compounds, and they will bind to the CB1 receptors. And, and whenever in the brain you have lots of uh, ligand and cannabinoids and few receptors, and what happens over time is that the receptor number is going to decrease. So actually, my lab and some other labs have thought about this that could we use some cannabinoid compounds to uh, to actually prevent the, you know, the surging cannabinoids 
resulting in the down regulation of the CBR symptoms. Okay? So uh, this research is ongoing, it's very hard to study. The bottom line is we don't know whether CBD or TAC for that matter or any other drug for that matter would be effective um, in, as an anti epileptogenic drug. Um, so this is kind of a couple of related questions, so I'm going to put them together as one question. Um, so uh, does CBD affect the hormone system, and more specifically, does it affect sperm count, and if somebody is pregnant and wants to take CBD, what should their concerns be? This is for our clinicians on the <laughs> well, I mean, so I, I, I've talked a little bit about this in some other discussions, and I do believe that um, that at least uh, THC does affect sperm counts, both in number and quality of sperm. Um, and for women, there is some data that um, marijuana, uh, with all of its you know contained compounds, can uh, decrease fertility, um, you know, decrease ovulation, and have some other effects on um, on female pregnancy. Um, I, I don't know a lot about its actual effects on the rest of the hormonal system for menstruation or for you know, lactation or those types of things, but I think in general it does have an effect on fertility. Um, I, I think the question about um, the um, pregnant women taking CBD, I think we have learned from Yvonne's talk that, um, you know, that there are um, effects that CBD should enact, or, or that endocannabinoids enact in neuronal development and brain development. And so I think I would be um, very concerned that um, administration of CBD for a pregnant woman with epilepsy could result in altered brain development for the fetus. Um, but I don't know that we have any of, those, any of that as, as significant evidence yet, because we really haven't been using it for very long. Um, most anticonvulsant compounds um, that are available on the market that are traditional seizure medications have registries that allow you to track the outcomes of, um, of pregnancies because unfortunately most um, research done in uh, anticonvulsant medications excludes women who are pregnant uh, and that's true for many medications and so you, it's hard to get the information about how drugs affect the developing fetus because we don't want to take that risk uh, at first. So I think most of that data comes from registries, and we don't have any registry of data like that yet for CBD. Um, I would think that as the use of, of those medicines expands and becomes more commercial, that perhaps you know, something like that would be started to monitor that. Um, but that would be the worry, I think, would be for a great development of, of the infant. And I would add that um, you guys can probably understand why we can't do research on pregnant Right? Because if you think about it, it's pretty unethical to say, okay, you guys take this medicine and you guys don't, and let's see how the babies do. Like it's considered pretty bad science and pretty unethical. Um, that's why we do this observational study. So we, we have everybody enroll in, and there's one called the North American Pregnancy Registry. And every single one of my patients that gets pregnant gets this harped at them um, to enroll in it because it's the only way that we learn. So, for example, in 2000. Eight, as a neurology resident, I was not aware that topiramate could be harmful in pregnancy, but it came out a couple years later that it absolutely is. And we wouldn't have learned that if we wouldn't have had these registries. So these women who enroll voluntarily to help us with the science. So any woman who I see in my clinic, I'm just going to have to say we don't know enough yet. Um, some science which suggests that we shouldn't get pregnant on the medicine, just like a lot of the seizure medicines. Um, but if you do get pregnant and you're staying on the medicine, enroll in the registry so we can learn more. Um, how does CBD affect neurotransmitters? Uh, this is what Dr. Schultz says. Yeah, so um, the CBD affect neurotransmitters. So you know, this is really the big question um, that we want to know. CBD, we know, you know, as I mentioned in my talk, we know that it affects, you know, tens of molecular targets, 65 or more. Uh, so out of those, what could affect neurotransmitter release, for example? Uh, many of those could actually. So anything that, uh, any molecular uh, signaling pathway that involves calcium, and calcium in your in your body, over 
It's a very important signaling molecule. And CBD, various pathways, affects calcium regulation in the brain. And so there are many potential ways that CBD could uh, modulate a neurotransmitter release um, and uh, also probably synthesis of neurotransmitters. Uh, and by the way, CBD may itself regulate the endocrine amenoid system as well. So it's a complicated uh, question and there are no easy answers, unfortunately. There are probably many pathways, but which one of them are really important in general? And which one of them are important at clinically relevant concentration? And which one of them are important in the epileptic brain, specifically? Uh, that's just not known yet. Do we know uh, just a little more specifically about the impact of CBD on serotonin or dopamine? Yes, yeah, so, uh, so uh, I don't know about serotonin specifically, but, but dopamine signaling system definitely um, uh, definitely is, is affected by, by uh, the cannabinoid, cannabinoids in general. Um, I, uh, I don't know about CBD action specifically on the, on, uh, on the 5-HT of the serotonin system. One of the targets that CBD is supposed to act on is a particular serotonin receptor uh, that's known. But as I said, it's one of the big, you know, this is bucket, and yes, serotonin is in it. It's a potential um, way that, that CBD may act. So serotonin is probably part of it, dopamine is probably part of it, but I don't think it's really well understood, or I know it's not well understood. Does the dose of CBD need to change as a child ages? Um, so typically, uh, um, for pediatric epilepsy, most medication is based on uh, on weight. Um, so the studies for um, for Abdilex uh, examined uh, kind of three or two levels mainly. There's placebo, and then 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and then 20 milligrams of medication per kilogram of body weight. And so, uh, you know, I think as a child grows, uh, they they will increase in weight, and then. You know, we would give them more medication. I don't. What I don't know is, you know, based on how the cannabinoid, the endocannabinoid system changes as we age, do we need more or less medication to treat a 35-year-old person than we would need to treat a five-year-old person with epilepsy? And I think that question is not necessarily known yet. Um, I don't know that I know how old the oldest patients in the trials are. 55, okay. But there probably were not a large number of those patients in that trial, enough to draw sufficient conclusions to say those patients, those older patients need X amount higher you know, of, of the medication than do the younger patients. I think the majority of the patients were, were younger because of the syndromes that were being studied. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to direct this at anybody in particular, but uh, jump in if you know the answer. Uh, what type of chemicals compete with CBD at the synaptic level? <laughs> compete? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the easiest way to answer this is that, well, there's no easy answer. But, but the way I would say is that, you know, if, if, uh, so since CBD is known to modulate, uh, for example, as we just mentioned, certain types of serotonin receptors, then anything that's going to act through serotonin, other compounds like serotonin itself, anything that acts through serotonin receptors, uh, then is going to compete in one sense with CBD, right? So, uh, you know, these molecular systems in general are, are uh, you can think of them as, uh, as a network, right? Like, you know, many people, these are your nearest neighbors and they know people. Similarly, with molecular systems, uh, they interact with each other. And uh, any time you, so you have what you call, call it, what you would call a node, like a serotonin receptor, that is going to be modulated by many natural ligands, and in itself is going to have uh, effects on many other systems. 
So in that sense, uh, anything that uh, you know CBD touches is major system like like uh, serotonin or calcium channels so anything that regulates calcium as I would mention or the mysterious uh, protein that we refer to as GPR55 I mentioned that that's what many scientists believe is the molecule, most important molecular target uh, for CBD uh, in terms of epilepsy and GPR55 is uh, believed uh, uh, to um, regulate both excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitter release. So in that sense, CBD is competing with the natural uh, you know, inhibition and excitation. Um, so I think we've reached the end of our time for the question and answer period. I'd like to thank all of our speakers who uh, not only gave talks, but were willing to come up here and have questions fired at them. <laughs> so, um, from Dr. Solstice is that all of the answers are complicated and <laughs> may not be very good ones to any of these questions, but that we have a very intelligent audience who asks very good questions. I just wanted to add that I wanted to thank the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado. Um, if anybody isn't familiar with them, if this is your first contact with them, um, they're an incredible foundation and make sure to, they have so many resources for people, so many educational uh, things that you can be doing, so please contact the people here so I wanted to thank them. Yes, and I, I just want to say that um, that you know uh, you might might have picked up on the fact what you just said that, that it's in fact many things we don't understand about the, the economy right? And part of the problem is that it's just hard to do research in cannabinoids because when I asked for federal license, I got THC and a CBD in my lab. You know, two people in my in my lab did nothing for three months, just filled out forms, and uh, you know, and it's under lock and key, and it's extremely hard to, uh, you know, we are under like spot, uh, you know, um, court checks and everything. Uh, so the legislators have to, at some point, make it easier for scientists to to do research, and particularly for research in epilepsy. Epilepsy itself is very complex. So when you superimpose on that complicated thing, right, the economy of the system, and then on top of it, when you have the problems with just obtaining these compounds, and uh, that that is a major issue. So if you have the chance, talk to your legislators and, and convince them that researchers need this. Like for example, like I have a minute. I just have I just a good story. I had I had a, an ex military um, person served this country uh, and he contacted me and he said um he actually was a special old guy and he said that i have all of my, you know, many many of my friends who are injured and they find marijuana to be beneficial right and what he decided to do was to uh have a company uh in california that would grow marijuana and he wanted to make um compounds that would be similar to what people use on the street, right? But we would know exactly how much THC, how much CBD, etc., etc., is it in these compounds. In oil form, and oil form, and all that. They wanted scientists to buy this from this company, right? And use them, right? Uh, so it would be purely, this whole company would be just supplying uh, cannabinoid products only for researchers. Right? That was the thing. They didn't want to make profit. The whole point was to supply uh, research grade uh, various compounds that are related to cannabis. And he got the investors, right? Uh, and so everything is ready to go. And, you know, and I would like to buy it from him. And uh, he actually wanted to sponsor uh, uh, research in my lab um, and all that. And we are at a stand standstill for the last about year and a half. Because you cannot get this license to grow the marijuana uh, in California for these purposes, the federal license. At the time when we can go there and buy the stuff in Palo Alto, right? But it's legal. So, uh, you know, so, but not for research. So, so, so that, that, that I, I just wanted to mention this to you.
because you are interested partisans, obviously. But if you want uh, me and other people uh, to be kind of answer, you know, less often with the words, we don't know more research is needed, one way to do this is to allow people to do research, and we need the compounds, the CBD and TNC. So, 